Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we continue our Lenten journey this evening, we see the contrast between Mary and Judas. The contrast between generosity and greed. The contrast between giving and getting. The contrast between joy and jealousy. Mary points to the joys of giving. Mary points to the joys of Jesus. We think of ourselves always as generous, joyful, and always giving. We need to admit that our lives don't live up to this perfect standard that our Lord God expects. Still, our Heavenly Father invites us to return to Him to confess our shortcomings and our sins. Heavenly Father, we confess that we have committed sins of greed, jealousy, and selfishness. We have sinned against you in thoughts, words, and actions. Have mercy on us, Lord. Forgive us, renew our generosity, and lead us out of greedy selfishness. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm this evening is Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his passion. Enter his gates of thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson, as we focus in on Mary of Bethany and the joy of giving, begins in Proverbs chapter 11, beginning with verse 24. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessings will be enriched. The one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain. But a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 also speaks of generosity. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he is distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all your generosity, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, 
And Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also <coughs> to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plan to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. We continue with our sermon hymn, Behold the Lamb of God, John said. Please be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who through him we become rich by means of his power. Your Christian friends, have you ever been in a store or a flea market and picked up an object with no price tag on it? You look at it and you say to yourself, well, how much is it worth? Maybe more to the point, how much are you willing to spend? At a time of economic uncertainty and rising inflation, impulsive purchases and spur-of-the-moment spending a lot of times is put on hold as we well, look it over and say, is this really flinging a want on me or is it an actual need? But that question, how much is it really worth, is one that's really worth pondering. Back in the day when Hollywood really still produced movie stars, Elizabeth Taylor found herself in London at a premiere of one of her movies. And in attendance at that movie was Princess Margaret, the Queen Elizabeth's sister. And as they were shaking hands at the end of the movie, Princess Margaret noticed a huge diamond ring on Elizabeth Taylor's hand. And she looked at it, and she looked at Elizabeth Taylor, and she said, isn't that a bit vulgar? And Elizabeth Taylor, without missing a beat, took the ring off her finger, put it on the princess's hand, and said, there. I guess it's not so vulgar anymore. What Elizabeth Taylor was really saying in so many words is that, yes, beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but oftentimes, jealousy is in the eye of the beholder. But that question, how much is it worth, is a question that is really worth thinking about this evening. And it's asked for us in a very different way by the second witness to Christ's passion, and that is Mary of Bethany. She's a sister to Martha and Lazarus, and a good friend of a man named Simon, who is known in the Bible as Simon the leper. They lived in Bethany, and her words and her actions that you heard in tonight's gospel actually hit us in the heart too. It isn't how much is it worth, but how much is he worth? Is he worth the effort? Is he really worth the cost? You know, I think that sometimes we find ourselves maybe being a little resentful because Jesus asks of our time, our talents, and our treasures. And then there are those embarrassing moments when people actually find out that we are Bible-believing Christians who come and worship on a regular basis. But what we can learn from Mary as a witness to Christ's passion is simply this. Jesus is worth this and so much more. Because there's a reason, there's a reason enough for us to show Christ our love. And, finally, and secondly, use your time, use the opportunity to show him that love. Now the events of tonight's gospel happened on Saturday night before Palm Sunday. And Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem, and he comes to this little town just outside Jerusalem, maybe not even a mile or so, to the home of Mary and Martha, or I should say where Mary and Martha and Lazarus and this gentleman by the name of Simon lived. And it was a banquet that was going to be held at Simon's house as Matthew and Mark note in their Gospels. Because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus was a wanted man. And why? Because the Jewish government, the Jewish elites, they had a real big problem with Jesus. Jesus' popularity was growing. Jesus' influence was growing and impeding the spiritual life of the people. And as far as these Jewish elites were concerned, they wanted power. They wanted not only the spiritual power, but they wanted the political power over Jesus, and Jesus was robbing them of that. And where it all came to a head was at this town called Bethany. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and there was no denying what Jesus had done. It couldn't be explained the way that maybe they fell into a coma or they simply passed out. Lazarus had been dead three days. The tomb, the cave tomb, was sealed. 
And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, there stood Lazarus with all of those burial strips of cloth over him. They hated Jesus, and they wanted him dead. But this group of friends honored Jesus. They knew that Jesus was making his way to the Passover, and so they invited him for dinner. They didn't worry about hateful people. They didn't worry about the fact that by entertaining Jesus, they were putting themselves in danger. No, they loved Jesus, and they had every reason to thank and to show their love for this God who had given them everything, because their loved ones were as good as dead. Simon, a family friend who is known as Simon the leper in the scriptures, was healed of his leprosy. We don't have that account in the Gospels, but that's what we're led to believe as we hear this account. And as far as Lazarus, he was restored to his sister. So Mary, or I should say Martha served, Simon hosted, and Mary, well, Mary did the most precious thing. She gave a gift of tremendous value. This is the same Mary who sat at Jesus' feet. The same Mary who listened to God's word. The same Mary who, by the grace of God, saw her Lord and Savior and had that wonderful gift of faith. And so while everyone is eating and probably conversing, she quietly went into her room and got a bottle, a bottle of what's called pure nard. This was a perfume that scholar says came from India. It was a perfume that was made from rose petals. In other words, the, the condensed oil of roses. And as, as John describes it, when she knelt down and wiped Jesus' feet, pouring this perfume on Jesus' feet and then wiping Jesus' feet with her hair, the entire house was filled with this wonderful, wonderful aroma of roses. Now, as you heard at the beginning of the service, this was no small gift. This was a gift that was probably worth tens of thousands of dollars in the ancient world. It had to be imported all the way from India. It was a way in which people would save for their retirement, so to speak, for their old age. And here Mary is pouring it out completely on Jesus' feet. And her action draws immediate attention. You can hear the outrage in Judas' voice. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii? Isn't it interesting? He knows exactly how much you can get for this. And why was it not given to the poor? Yes, we see the jealousy. Jealousy in the eye of the beholder. Someone who saw this wonderful gift and said, why would he deserve that? And as you heard, it wasn't because Judas loved the poor. It's because he loved himself. Jesus sets it straight and says, leave her alone so that she may keep it or do it for me for the day of my burial. So what Jesus sees is what we can't see. Jesus saw the faith. Jesus saw the love. Jesus saw the motive. From our perspective, yes, we know that Jesus' death and what Jesus' death and resurrection is. Only God could give us this kind of gift of forgiveness, life, and salvation. But how precious is it? Is it worth an entire year's worth of wages? Is it bigger than your 401k? Is it bigger than the lottery ticket that is sale, on sale tonight for the millions of dollars for the drawing that will be held either Friday or Saturday. The question is, how much really is Jesus worth? But don't answer that quite yet. Think about it. Haven't our lives too, in a sense, hung in the balance? Haven't there been times and moments when we have been afraid? When we face illnesses, when we face dangers, when we have faced accidents and troubles where we didn't know what the outcome was going to be, why are we still here today? It's because of our Lord and Savior. 
This Lord and Savior still says to us today, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. But there's still more. Jesus and this treasure of forgiveness, life, and salvation gives us above all God's gift of certainty. Certainty that our lives are firmly in his hands. And think about that. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As Paul looks at his life, he is, he is journeying from life into life. And that's how every Christian needs to look and approach their lives here on this earth right now. Yes, we're living in a time of terrible uncertainty. How high is the price of gas going to go? Is there going to be famine next year because farmers won't be able to get enough fertilizer? What is going to happen to what we know as the American life? What is going to happen to my family? What is going to happen to me? All of us have come into church tonight with some of those thoughts kind of rolling around in our minds. But Jesus still says that he's in control. Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love never changes. And Jesus says that even if death comes, and comes maybe under ways that we would never expect, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Yes, Jesus is worth this, as Mary tells us tonight, and much, much more. As there is reason then for us to show love, let us also see that we need to use the opportunity as God presents us to act on that love. Now, how many times have you said to yourself, manana, someday or tomorrow? It calls to mind another Hollywood actress, Gone with the Wind. Remember the closing scene there in Gone with the Wind where Tara is looking at the situation and she says, oh, I can't worry about that today because tomorrow is another day. And you know, a lot of times we live our lives like that. We put off today what we think we can do tomorrow. And we simply let opportunity slip through our fingers. The point is, many times it's not because our lives are just so busy, 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 because 50 years ago there were still 24 hours in a day. It's because we don't allocate time in the way our grandfathers and great-grandfathers did. So maybe it's time for us to look at the moment. What can we do? How can we, by the grace of God, show Jesus our love? Look at Simon the leper in our text. He makes most of that moment as he sees Jesus coming through Bethany. Come to my house. Come for dinner. He doesn't have endless emails and texts and, and trying to figure out the schedule and how is this going to work and how is that going to work. He contacts Martha, and Martha's more than willing to put a meal together at a moment's notice. And likewise, look at Mary. She acts. She acts impulsively, doesn't she? She acts in the moment. She doesn't look at this and say, well, can I really do without this? Because really, this is my life savings for old age? No, she freely gives it to Jesus as an act of love, as an act of faith. So at the beginning of tonight's sermon, I asked that question, there's beauty in the sight of the beholder, but there's also jealousy in the sight of the owner. Jesus asked us to think about that for a moment. For us, both of those statements are true. In the sight of God, God sees you. And me is totally beautiful in his sight. And he sees us in spite of our sins. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, is what the Apostle Paul teaches us. God loves us even though we are covered with our dirt, our shame, and all of our guilt. And he washes it all away again and again through the precious blood of Jesus. Through his active keeping of the law in our place, God makes us righteous and perfect in his sight once again. God didn't stop and say to himself, well, I need to think this over. 
or maybe I should, or maybe this isn't the right opportunity. No, God acted. God acted impulsively. God acted in the moment. God sent his son so that we could be forgiven in the sight of God. And that's why there is beauty in the sight of the owner. God sees us as his very own. By faith, you and I possess all the blessings of Christ, all of them, inside and out, from top to bottom. Not one of them is missing. You are clean and perfect and righteous in the sight of God. So as we look at Mary, as we look at Simon the leper, as we look at Martha, we see people who are acting in love, who are making the most of their opportunity. So what kind of extravagant opportunities can we use for Jesus? Well, don't get lost in the idea of tomorrow or all the good intentions. See what you can do now. Maybe it comes down to coming to services here during midweek services here in Lent for the next four or five weeks. Maybe it also is giving you the opportunity to call that friend or neighbor or family, friend or relative to come and join you for church. Maybe it's time to mend the fence or to give that invitation to come and to, fi to find Jesus who brings rest for our souls. Maybe we can act upon that intention that we've had in our own heart of hearts to give a gift to show Jesus our love. When we really stop to think about it, as Mary teaches us, Jesus is worth this and much, much more. We don't have anything to lose, but in Christ, we have gained everything. So as we look at our lives, as we look at Jesus, as we look at what we have received, yes, we can join with Mary in saying, Jesus is worth this and so much more. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rise. <laughs> Savior is, 
and be strengthened in our faith, so that Christ may be, that we may grow in all things to him who is our life and our salvation. Continue to bless us with this newness of life that you have promised us, and may we cheerfully await the glorious appearance of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, by your death upon the cross, you have forgiven the sins of all people. Help us to have compassion on others and to reflect your generous love to them. For all people are created in your image, and on your, our hearts imprint your image. Blessed Jesus, Jesus, King of grace. Lord, give us the strength to forgive others as you have forgiven us. On our hearts imprint your image. Blessed, Blessed Jesus, Jesus, King of grace. O Lord, embolden us to be generous with all the good gifts that you have given us. Prevent us from any greed or dishonesty that would harm others and be a poor reflection upon you. On our hearts and print your image. Blessed, Blessed Jesus, King of grace. O Lord, instill in us a love for the poor that is not rooted in our superiority over them or in some vain hope of making ourselves feel better. Rather, teach us how to love in true humility and service. On our hearts and print your image. Blessed Bless Jesus, King of grace. O Lord, we pray for the leaders of this nation and of all nations throughout the world that your wisdom would be upon them for the health and welfare of all people. On, your, on our hearts and print your image. Bless Blessed Jesus, Jesus, King of grace. O Lord, we pray for all Christians throughout this world. As we follow you on whatever journeys you send us, Remind us that we are united with you and with all who follow you by baptism into your death and resurrection. On our hearts and print your image. Bless the Jesus, King of grace. O Lord, be near to all those who are sick, injured, and recovering. Give them your healing and patience. On our hearts and print your image. Bless the Jesus, King of grace. O Lord, send comfort and hope to all those who grieve. Grant them that the power of your resurrection to eternal life may shine through the darkness of their grief. On our hearts and preach your image, bless the Jesus, King of grace. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come, give to us your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We close with our final hymn, hymn number 422. Please be seated. Thank you. 